Sorry. Evening and welcome to tonight's session of Ask the Farmer. Uh, my name is Bridget Barry of the Farming for Nature project, and I am joined tonight with my co-host Brendan Dunford, who is a volunteer with the Farming for Nature project and works on the Burn program, and our guest speaker. So Farming for Nature was set up to encourage and inspire farmers that farm or wish to farm more with nature. One of the ways we do this is we find exemplary farmers each year that are working alongside nature, and these are called our Farming for Nature ambassadors. We um, use this series uh, throughout the winter in order to speak to each of these farmers, as many of them as possible, and ask them about their tried and tested methods of how they farm and how they work alongside nature while having uh, viable businesses and viable farms. It's also an opportunity for the audience to be able to ask questions. So the format of the next hour is myself and Brendan will kick start with a few questions uh, to our guest speaker. And then, there is a chat box on your banner. Uh, feel free to ask our guest speaker any questions you'd like about how she farms alongside nature um, and her farming practices. So on to tonight's speaker. We are delighted to have Sinead Moran join us. Sinead is a, a dairy farmer. She, has, she and her partner, Mick McGrath, um, farm 40 acres up in County Mayo. Uh, where they ha have a micro dairy and they sell directly to their customers. Um, they used to be a, a, have a suckler herd, but they've moved more recently into dairy. So we'll find out a bit more about this in a while. Uh, they are on a high nature value farm. And if you haven't seen their video, uh, do watch it through uh, our YouTube channel on farmingfornature.ie. Sinead also has a background as an environmentalist and has set up uh, it's a, a, a website called Future, which supports local producers across Ireland to connect directly with their customer. So Sinead, thank you for joining us tonight and uh, welcome. Um, so you might just start Sinead telling me about your own journey, how you became a farmer and what led you to be where you are now uh, in relation to kind of the environment and conservation and, and farming. Uh, yeah, so... Um... I'm still, I think, trying to be a farmer. <laughs> uh, it's a journey. Uh, I grew up on um, a suckler farm here uh, in East Mayo. Uh, but as I said a thousand times before, my role growing up on the farm was very much to stand in a gap. I had nothing bar name an odd pet cow and stand in a gap. I had no interest. Um, and could never see myself farming. So I did the usual thing. I finished my leaving search, I traveled, uh, worked at different things. And I ended up, when I was older, uh, 28, I moved back to Ireland and decided that that was the time to go to college. And uh, I went to focus more kind of on politics and the environment and the kind of interconnections in between them. And from there, in a very roundabout way, um, I ended up, working on uh, agri-policy. So being a mature student, I didn't really want to wait until I'd finished my degree um, to pick up work experience. So I applied to a load of different places and on Tashka, the National Trust, uh, gave me work experience on uh, the 2013 submission for the gap. And at the time, um, they said, you know, do you know much about farming coming from the west of Ireland? And I said, yeah, I grew up on a farm. I just have a good bit of knowledge. I slightly lied through my teeth and came back and asked uh, Mick, basically, what was the gap? How did it work? And he gave me a note of everything that he knew about it. And um, there I... Sinead, you might have to take out your earphones or something. There's another yeah. feed. Sorry. Yeah, just... sure. Hold on now and I'll change the mic. Sorry about this. Better? Yep, yep, give it a go. Good. I guess I'm out of my ears as well. Uh, yeah, so long story short, uh, worked in agri policy and from there kind of uh, developed an interest with the kind of interconnections between the environment and agriculture. And I finished my degree and I took a master's in um, agriculture in food security in NUIG. And that was 2015. And my um, thesis at the time was uh, the impact of reducing beef and dairy uh, consumption on national greenhouse gas emissions in six different countries. And that same summer, while I was in Colombia writing my thesis, 
uh, Nick put 15 hairs on. So that kind of threw me into the deep end, uh, into, I suppose, farming from for real uh, and not looking at it from paperwork. So uh, from there, that kind of, uh, I suppose, after my thesis, and um, we were doing a bit more on the farm, but again, from a distance, because we were so close, we just had heifers at the time. Um, and they, or Mick was very much at the time saying that he felt the land was uh, not, not dead, but, but not alive. And he thought that it just needed something. So he insisted on stocking it. And for me, I thought, right, okay, if we're gonna stock this land, we're gonna have to figure out how we can farm it to a really high standard. Um, so from there, I came across uh, the results-based payments, the stuff out of Sligo IT on High Nature Valley Farmland, obviously came across the Burn Life Project and all these other things and kind of thought, okay, what have we got and, and how can we kind of implement a lot of that stuff? And I suppose we're really, really lucky um, and we're always very clear about this. We've started from a very, very good base. So I'm gonna just um, jump into a quick screen share to kind of show. Um, just tell me if you can see these. Can you see this? It's starting, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So we um, have started from a really, really good base because we have a really species rich um, sward, thick hedgerows, and basically we have land that was never found. So it is what we would refer to as high nature value. So we just kind of get to start from that really good base and over the last five years, we've been trying to figure out ways that we can manage that with livestock that both kind of feeds our livestock and maintains a, habit for, a habitat for the nature that's on our farm. And then slowly but surely try to figure out how we could actually make a living off that and stay farming full time. Well, there we go. So yeah, no, uh, I suppose one of the questions that springs to mind, and I know that I've already received this question, is and you've mentioned you obviously came from a really good starting place, but how have you had to enhance your multi species swords at all? Have you, you haven't receded, but have you, have you, or have you done any natural regeneration? Or is it literally true grazing? We see what we see with these kind of this biodiversity in front of us. Um, I suppose we, yeah, we started from a very good base um, in the sense that the ground hadn't been managed intensely. But by the time we stopped it, it hadn't been grazed at all in, in four and a half years. So it was really kind of matted and overgrown. And when you used to walk across it, there was a bounce, you know, because it was just years of, of long kind of grass. And um, grazing it has definitely brought the meadow alive because I remember the first few years that we, we were back and when we used to go up the fields for a walk with the dog, I, I never remember the meadow that we have now. So grazing has definitely um, had an impact on that. So we, from, we kind of started to monitor a little bit late. Um, I suppose the first year was just trying to figure out how we were going to graze it. So we came across stuff like mob grazing through Clive Bright and um, came across then holistic management on a lot of Alan Savory stuff. And I suppose from there, we are trying to, we take kind of elements of everything and, and manage it in a way that the biggest thing that we're trying to do, and I think when people talk about holistic grazing, I think the biggest thing that we find for us, is we kind of have three rules and we, we don't eat the grass really short. So we eat about half of it and we move them we allow them to trample a bit and rest. They're the three main things. And I think the best way to think of it is imagine um, grass, uh, the grass leaves as a solar panel. So every time you remove all those leaves, then that grass is having to dig down into its roots and pull up energy to kind of grow itself again, to create that, uh, that solar panel to photosynthesize. Whereas when you're leaving that bit, you're not, having, you're not having to kind of reboot and push down into the reserves for that grass to grow back. Uh, so yeah, so that's kind of where we we go so with it. You yep. might just explain to me, Sinead, um, the the amount of stock you have, how long you have it out. Like, say your season, how long you have it out, uh, your stock outside. Because um, I think people are kind of probably wondering, 
you know, per acre, how much, how much stock do you have sure. going around mob grazing or adaptive grazing? Uh, uh, yep, so I'll uh, see if I can pull up one of the winter ones. So when we had um, the sucker cows, we, uh, we used to actually at winter. So this is the first year, hopefully if we get the shed finished in time, that we'll uh, actually house stock. I would start from a really good base on a biodiversity front with a really kind of species rich pasture. The downside of it is that we actually had no infrastructure. So there was an old hay shed that existed, but that was it. So um, the, the whole part of kind of starting from a really good base, we haven't had putting costs with into our pasture and stuff, but we have had to put costs in over the last two years into infrastructure and getting to where we are now with the micro dairy um, to be able to actually make a living off it. Because for the first uh, year, we just had 15 heifers and they really, all they did, and we weren't really doing much with them uh, grazing wise or managing it wise, was basically just getting them in there to, uh, to graze it off basically. Um, and then in the second year, that's when we really started mob grazing. So in our second year, we have 17 acres in a block um, around the house. And then we have another 10 acres that's in two different fields and we use that as our outside solid ground. So in the first year we had 10 cows, 10 calves on the 17 acres and we ran them from mid-March right through until mid-November and then we started to kind of feed uh, silage and in the second year we actually pushed our grazing out to mid-December mm -hmm. with the same amount of stock and um, which we kind of so we were feeding them from I think it was just a couple of days before Christmas Day in the third year. So that was 10 cows, 10 calves, to 10 cows, 10 calves throughout the, gra the grazing season. And that first year with the first um, calves, they went out from, they started calving from mid-March. They went out and we weaned them in the October and sold our weanlands. And our biggest we weaning that year was a uh, bull calf from a first time heifer. He was 330 kilos. He was a limousine cross and he was solely fed on pasture and, and um, milk from the cow. And every one of them were the same. And we brought them to the market and we got, you know, we were getting, I think, 600 and something euros at the time per calf, which was really good when you think of the fact that uh, Chagas and that, I think the figure is something like 650 euros a cost to run a sucker cow. Mm -hmm. We didn't have those costs because what we found with the way we graze, so our, our minimum, the minimum amount of time uh, for rest that we would have from paddock to paddock would be 28, 30 days. But when we had the suckers, we were getting, like we were having rest periods of up to 60 days. So you're breaking worm cycles and things like that when cows aren't going back over uh, pasture. Uh, so we didn't have those kind of burdens. We also didn't have any feed issues because again, the advantage of having species rich uh, pasture is that they pretty much can get everything they need from it. Like in that photo here, you can see uh, on the bottom left is plantain. Uh, we've lots of that, and it's actually a really, really high protein uh, grass herb, and the cows love it. It's also a natural anti wormer as well, um, and it has a deep tap root, so it's full of vitamins for them. So, so, would you have any drainage problems in the winter? I mean, I'd say that's probably what a lot of conventional farmers are probably asking, or is it because it's high nature value land, it's, it's less of a problem, or the type breed of cattle is more? Yeah, there's a lot of different things. Like, there's no one element. If there's anything that we've definitely are 100 percent sure of over the last years, is diversity is key, and diversity in everything. So diversity in stock. We've had numerous different breeds over the last couple of years. Obviously, with suckers as well, we've changed things in and around. And um, and diversity of pasture definitely has a big element. Now we're lucky enough. We're in East Mayo, and actually, the majority of our land is. Uh, quite sandy and hilly and we only have a small part that would classify maybe as wet um, and that is wet because of natural springs that would have flooded a little bit in the winter before but they, they really flooded in the last five years because the thick forest has actually got in front of us. So with the drainage of that and the blocked up the kind of natural flow of those same wells we're just behind it so it backs up on, on our side. So kind of when it's when the rain really starts to kick in from end of October, or November, we just don't put them in around that field so mm -hmm. that they're not plowing it up. But generally after that, um, we don't really have issues with kind of 
it's much worse. So uh, obviously uh, that was a beautiful Hawthorn, I assume Hawthorn, not Blackthorn, um, hedgerow I just saw. Um, your, so what kind of management do you do for nature or not do around the farm? Uh, number one is uh, we try not to interfere too much, I suppose. As I said, because we started from a really good base, everything we try to do is to not overmanage, but manage do in the farm, if that makes sense. So we're not trying to manage. We have great pasture, we have great hedgerows, so we're just trying to manage our livestock so that we don't negatively impact that and we improve it. So we had um, an ecologist come out to us uh, in July, not last year, the year before. And he's actually doing a study on stone walls. So in that hedgerow there, actually, there's a stone wall underneath it. And he was going to a load of different uh, farms from intensive to extensive, uh, organic, non-organic, and he was uh, doing an assessment on the stone walls to see what kind of life they were holding. And what he found was we actually had more life out in our pasture than we did in our stone walls. Mm -hmm. And that was July like, so the, the cows had actually come off this field as well. And we still had, um, we still have kind of more life out in our pasture. So we, we kind of do different things like that or invite as many people as we can on to assess things for us to see kind of how we are doing for nature. And we also, um, I do a lot of stuff on the Biodiversity Ireland app. So I kind of monitor that every year. Um, like we used to have cow slip in uh, one part of the field. Now we kind of have it out in the middle. Mm. Um, and it has no impact. And actually, to be honest with you, what we find is one of the, the cows that we've had the longest, they pretty much eat everything in our pastures. There's not much they don't eat. They can be selective at different times of the year. I actually have a video, but I couldn't find it on the laptop. Uh, one of the cows uh, walking around the paddock, selectively grazing, planting. So she was doing that because she obviously knew herself that she needed that because it's an anti-wormer. So again, that's the, the benefit of having that diverse ward is uh, the cows themselves kind of know what to eat. That's a, a it's a beautiful diverse ward that you were just showing there, actually. Um, it, so you might just, um, if you don't mind me asking, like you've you've moved to a micro dairy away from Sockler herd. The probably some people are probably thinking that's quite labour intensive. Uh, does the economics of it work for you in terms of cost benefit? Um, yes, because while it, we kind of had two choices to make and it was, the choice really was about lifestyle, I suppose, the way that we wanted to live. When, as a soccer farm, for the three years that we had Wayne and Stel, um, we were making profit in the sense of we didn't have major inputs. So from day dot, we knew that the best thing, the only thing that we could control when we first started out was what we put into it. So we just didn't put into it. So there was no artificial fertilizers, there was no meal, there was no routinely dosing, things like that. So we were trying to, through management and the fact that we have a really diverse board, we were able to kind of meet your needs. So selling green and yes, the farm was able to pay for itself and make a small profit. But what we found was that our work, we were putting a lot of work in and what we were making wasn't covering the work we you know, the, the daily moves for the grazing and things like that with the sucker herd, it just wasn't paying. So we knew that we kind of had to change the model so that we could farm full time, really. So through uh, Future, which you mentioned at the start, I've gotten to meet kind of loads of different farmers who have done things differently on their farms. And uh, I met Nini and Old Copper down in Tipperary, and they were kind of our peers on the whole micro dairy front. Um, and in conversations with them, given that they actually have one, they have one acre more than us, we thought that we could do the same thing. So the year before we officially decided to go micro dairy, we had a few short horns, um, this one here in the photo, and she had too much milk for her calf, so we used to hand milk her a little bit for ourselves, and I think that kind of got us hooked on uh, raw milk. And so then we really had to sit down and work out the finances of it because while we haven't had to do a big investment into our pasture, we have had to do it into the infrastructure. So this year was our first year um, selling milk to a really local um, community because until 
our processing room is uh, finished and approved by the department. You can't sell more than 30 litres. So we just kind of took, I suppose, this year as a bit of a tester. And um, at the moment, the demand is obviously way outstripping what we can supply. Um, and we use, I think because of the way we manage it, because of the fact that we're organic, um, and people follow us online because we share a lot of stuff online. They like what we do um, and that's kind of created more demand around it. So with the pasture, what we found as well when we had the suckers with a few different breeds, but the ones that drove that did the best on that pasture were the shorthorns. Um, we had, and this is a beef shorthorn here. Um, and they just always, they just never had any issue. Whereas some of the other breeds, we had a couple of uh, Semental crosses, limousine crosses. They did well, but they always would need a mineral lick or something like that. You know, they just didn't seem to thrive as much where we found with the more traditional breed. And um, particularly for out wintering, like you can see it there in the photo, like a really thick winter coat. And um, you can see in the next one, nothing really fazed them. Mm. So again, the, the benefit of having thick hedgerows is they get plenty of shade and shelter as well in summer and in winter. So yeah, so that's kind of where we are for the breeds. So you've, you've, you're using traditional breeds, obviously more, as you were saying. Um, in terms of the milk, they're producing quite well for the milk uh, as well. And you, you were saying that the 30 litres, will you be able to manage, one, once you get the infrastructure in place, will that change the, the herd, the head per count, like head count per acre and change your business model as much? So yeah, so we'd basically just be able to kind of expand it. So this year we had a, a few that we were milking um, and we had a lot of surplus milk so we kept on calves this year as well and fed them on and we've made a lot of butter and we've frozen a lot of milk. <laughs> so I'm still <laughs> drinking raw milk, thankfully, in my tea. But um, yeah, next year will be the real kind of uh, test market, I suppose. But so far, like, we're, we're quite confident. Um, in what we're doing like there's a lot of work to it in regards to the infrastructure but we would have had to have done some infrastructure anyhow mm -hmm. and the financial cost into that infrastructure and um, would have been lo a lot more only for that we've taken a stone we've done a lot of work ourselves and um, mick thankfully is uh, a carpenter and with some building experience so that has come in very handy over the last two years very handy very handy and um, i'm just be um, just a couple of more questions before i hand over to brendan quickly um for conventional farmers any piece of advice you would give them on where to start if they want to kind of bring more nature onto their farm or change their system slightly to incorporate more biodiversity or conservation farming for the average green farmer uh, green. uh yeah, no, I think um, diversity, if you can definitely bring in more diversity in your pasture, I think you're going to see it uh, in numerous different things. It's not just uh, on the nature front, but I think you'll also see it in the healthier animals. Um, and I think therefore you'll also see it in your pocket in the sense that if your animals are able to get a lot of the nutrients they need through the pasture, then you're not having to kind of bring in um, or buy in external inputs, whether that is feed or licks or boluses and things like that. Um so uh, yeah, diversity in pasture and probably the easiest way to start, I think, particularly for anyone in dairy, conventional dairy, would probably be stuff like plantain. And there's some really interesting research out of New Zealand on plantain and um so it's a high protein crop, so particularly in silage. Um I think I had a photo there at the very start of our silage with the plantain. It's actually the first thing the cows will pick out when we open up a bale. Mm -hmm. They're pretty black, but they love it. Um, but plantain and the benefit it's had uh, also on reducing the amount of ammonia that is found in cow's urine. So there's that kind of uh, benefit as well. So definitely introduce more diversity and probably the easiest one to start with is, is plantain. And then the second thing would be um, just stop cutting the hedgerows. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, like, it costs you nothing. Just, just don't cut them, you know. Um, right angles don't exist in nature that I know of, and I, I hate to see, you know, the hedgerows just cut down as low as they are and boxed off. Um, again, it's, it's a fantastic thing for nature, but as a livestock farmer, there's multiple benefits for your livestock as well. Like you'll find um, 
and had a pool over there. Like ours at the start of the spring, the first thing you nearly always go for are the ash leaves. Whatever they, they have in them, they want them. Um, and when the elderflower is out, I always struggle to um, get the elderflowers off the trees before the gals. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, they're getting stuff out of it as well. Do you know, it's really interesting if you, you know, we obviously eat with our eyes and I'm looking at these photos just going, I want that butter. I want that. Where can I get it? <laughs> Listen, Sinead, just one more question and then I'll hand you over to Brendan. Um, if you were to give one top, top tip for farmers on when they, where they could get advice and support, um, where, where would it be? Uh, I definitely think probably from other farmers and there's loads of different networks. Obviously there's Farmers for Nature and all the videos, which is a great visual aid to see stuff on other farms and there's such a mix there and uh, there's the stuff like the high nature value farm and um, actually i think it's the website high nature value farming which talks a lot about i think particularly for farmers in the west who are on land that would be deemed marginal and um, and stuff like that you've got loads of different projects on burn life you could also start with the uh, NOS and the biological farming conference and um, I know this year it was online, so you can still actually go on and get a ticket and still have access to everything that was there. And again, that's a lot of that is farmers to farmers kind of talking about different things that they've tried out. And it's very much trial and error. Like I think for me, I think the first thing that has to change is your thinking and your philosophy and you need to know why you're doing this. And um, we decided to invest in this full time because we like the lifestyle and we want to we really, we really want to live by that kind of conserve, preserve, nurture principle, and we want to be on the farm full time. So we have to make a sustainable living at it, but we want to maintain everything that we have at the same time. And mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think just when you, you know yourself, if you've already logged on here, then you've already read the first step that you want to change something. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's plenty of information out there to get you started. Perfect, excellent. Um, I'll hand you over to Brendan now. Just for anyone who's listening, if they have questions for Sinead, do write them in the chat box. I can see we have a few in already. And Sinead, just to commend you on becoming a Farming for Nature ambassador. You have a lovely plaque there in the background. I love that. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so, Brendan, over to you if your broadband yeah. is working. Yeah, I think so. Um, thanks very much, Sinead. And the images are, are really lovely. I think they, they paint a really nice picture of the farm. I've read about the farm and I've heard a lot about it, so it's lovely to see the pictures as well to back it up. Good. And I think you're to be congratulated on making the move to farming. Um, a, a lot of us like talk about farming and do research and you know are involved in projects, but it's a whole different thing to actually practice as a farm. And I think it's quite a courageous step for young people. And I think it's great to see a young couple like yourselves being drawn back to farming um, and doing it uh, in, in, in such great harmony with, with nature. Um, I'll go to the questions previous, uh, almost straight away, but I just wanted to ask you a little bit about um, what kind of support you can avail of, um, Sinead, just in terms of the farm infrastructure, in terms of payments for the nature outcomes on your farm, um, agri-environmental schemes and so on, what kind of support do you get for the farming that you do? Uh, so that was actually a big thing for us. Uh, we don't, um, we actually, the only thing that we get uh, support wise on our farm is ANC, which is the area of natural constraint, uh, purely because we're uh, our geography is in our favor, we're in Mayo. Um, bar that, we actually don't uh, get anything else. We um, could have applied to gloss and different things like that, um, but we didn't really want to at the time and it wasn't open and then I was kind of a bit nervous that if we went for it would it restrict it because we didn't really know what we were doing and we wanted to kind of figure things out so we very much have to make the farm pay because we don't have subsidies and uh, regards to other supports then in, in relation to processing so there is then um, the leader fund uh, our experience hasn't been fantastic with it mostly because what we have looked to fund is uh, quite a small amount. It's quite labour intensive in regards to paperwork and processes that you kind of have to go through um, to get it. But what would be our dream is if there was a results-based payment, <laughs> we could get someone out to the farm scores 
um, and hopefully we started a really good high base and that it'd be just a matter of, of supporting us. But I think that was the big thing for us and that's probably why we call ourselves a micro dairy because we are, we are independent. The farm has to pay and there is no subsidies really for us to do it. But there is benefits there for, you know, if you've been, obviously this new entrance is different. If you have those kind of historical things and you've been in glass before, then obviously, yeah, there's, there's room within there to do things on the farm. Thanks, um, Sinead. I've got a few more questions myself, but I mean, the priority are the audience. So, Noel McDee, um, do you milk uh, the cows twice a day? Is bottled milk the only product you sell? Do you process the milk yourself? And what kind of parlour have you to milk the cows? I think all those might be looking ahead a little, Sinead, but maybe you want to comment back <laughs> on some of those. Uh, I think I, there you go. Um, that's the best photo I have of the parlour, which is literally right now, this, this year, it was uh, the crush and the mobile milker. So we are teeny tiny, uh, but what we have built is, and if I'll just see if I'll stop sharing here for a second, we'll see if I can jump in. Um, so this year we were milking six short horn cows. Um, we started off milking them twice a day and we obviously had too much milk. And uh, we thought we would have our process and them finished and ready to go, but COVID hit and that delayed everything. Uh, so we realized that that, um, wasn't going to kick off for us. So we kept milking the six and we moved to one today. And we actually are going to, unless things change, uh, stick to one today. Mostly because um, being a small farm, next year we'll be running 12 dairy short uh, We have seven acres of outside ground. So we um, will keep uh, the few suckers, those fluffy ones that you saw in the photos because we've soft spots for them. Uh, but um, we'll run the 12 dairy cows next year and we'll probably only milk them once a day because it's a lot easier to see them come into heat. Uh, they thrive better and if you kind of start them on that once a day they seem to do really well. So our um, short horns as well, they take a little bit longer from what we're told from, from others of experience. They take a little bit longer to kind of reach their and hit their peak but when they do, they very much kind of maintain there. So on once a day, uh, Milken, our dairy short horn, who is in her third lactation this year, was giving us 11 liters. So, you know, if we have, at our max, we can comfortably run, because uh, we've just taken on a few acres in front of us, we can probably comfortably run 18 cows. And that's again, organic, no external inputs, no feed, 100% uh, grass based. And if they were all giving us 11 litres, then that's more than enough for us to do because the next question being, we built a processing room, so we bottle and sell it all ourselves. So we're controlling the input and we're also controlling the output price as well. So we get kind of the full price. Oh, and the parlour, yes. Uh, I think I have, um, we built a small ramp, again, to keep our costs down. The only thing we had in our farm was, um, a small hay shed, it had no walls or anything else. Um, I actually don't have a full hay shed. Uh, so we just built around that. So we built a, a small ramp and the cows will go up a ramp at uh, 90 degrees and we go behind and we'll put in the foot. Very interesting. Um, and Sinead, another question from um, William Fitzsimons. If we need to source multi suicide a multi-species sword mix. Do you know where is a good contact in Ireland? Well, you already had yours, but would you know yourself um, a recommended um, um, contact sequences? In Ireland, not off the top of my head. The first point to call is nearly always Cotswold Seeds in the UK. How that's going to work post Brexit, I'm not really sure. Um, so I don't know anyone else off the top of my head in Ireland. But one great way is um, taking hay off the species rich meadow and bringing it in and feeding it. Um, some people say you can add clover to say, if you're feeding meal into meal or add clover seeds into a lick and they can supposedly survive through the rumen of the cow, if you want to add in that. Some people claim it works, I don't know, we haven't tried it. Uh, but Cotswold seeds is a very good start because they have a lot of um, uh, kind of on-farm uh, examples um, of the different seasons, but yeah. I'm not sure of anyone else in Ireland. 
And I think, as, as you said, Sinead, I think if, if you've got a neighbor, a neighboring farmer who's got some good species, uh, rich meadows, maybe to get some green hay from him and spread it, uh, like I said, or feed it out, it, it, it might, be, might be a cheaper and more cost effective way in the long run. Caroline yeah. O'Sullivan, did you come across any issues when selling raw milk? Now, again, uh, we, Mimi Crawford is on the call tonight, I think, um, so she'd have a lot of experience. But for yourself, uh, Sinead, is that something you anticipate as being an issue? Um, Mimi is the one to speak to. Uh, there's a great resource as well, Raw Milk Ireland, which uh, has all the legislation up there. You can't, uh, which is probably, it's, it's a good thing, obviously, you can't just um, turn around and sell raw milk out the gate without it being tested. So there's a lot of testing that has to be done to it. So I think once you kind of, it can seem a bit daunting the first time you look at the list of tests and you don't understand it, and you're kind of going, particularly for us, because we don't come from a long line of dairy, we're <laughs> the first dairy people in our, in our family. So we were a bit like, what is this? Uh, but no, I, I think it's definitely an opportunity for others. They might or may not have to change their systems or they just have to become aware of different things. But the probably best place to start if you want more information is just Ronald well, Carlin. Well, no, Carlin. Yeah. Um, Roku Ruiz, uh, do you have any trouble with liver fluke on your farm? And if so, how can or how can do you or do you manage it and comply with organic regulations in doing so? Uh, yeah, well, the first thing is with being organic, and um, the whole point of being organic is it, it's not you know it's not to be it's about uh, prevention rather than cure. But if you do have an issue, you can obviously uh, intervene because it's animal uh, on welfare grounds. So <clears throat> I think some the, I. We meet a lot of farmers who sometimes think if you're organic, you can't uh, help your cow she's sick, but you can, <laughs> obviously. Uh, we don't, we're lucky enough that we don't have any issues. Normally, the way we manage it is through our grazing. So again, as I said, uh, with the pasture, they're being moved daily at a minimum, if not twice a day, depending on uh, the growing year and the time of year. Uh, and they definitely, uh, even with the dairies this year, <clears throat> it shortens a little bit versus the sufflers. Um, we still, our average rest period is about 40 days. Sometimes it can go up to 60 uh, if it's a really great year. And our shortest uh, rotation would be 28, 30 days. So again, that uh, breaks a lot of uh, cycles in relation to worms and different things like that. It's, yeah, it's yeah. very interesting, um, uh, um, Sinead, about the, the, the mob grazing. It's it's. Can you tell me, um, I think Mick, Mick would have known the land as well from, from previous generations, but what's your stocking rate today like as vis-a-vis -vis what it was traditionally before, I suppose, before the 70s and we had, we had more chemical fertilizers, etc. Uh, well, actually, it was always kind of a yeah. mixed farm. It was really only in the later years that it focused solely on livestock. But in, in MJ's mother's time, um, there's a small cottage on the farm. I'm not sure if I have a photo of it in there. Um, and the farm it was only the 17 acres at the time and there was 13 of them raising it so the field that is now our meadow field was the last field to be reseeded and it was reseeded by a hay mix hay seeds that were collected off another farm and that was sometimes in the 40s we used to grow uh, oat and barley in that field and then uh, we have another field called the potato field and that's where they grew potatoes and then we have another field called the Glombui, which is what we call our farm now, which is Glombui Farm. And it's called the Glombui, I think I have a photo of it, because it is full of dandelion, birdfoot, and cow's lip. Just, you know, it kind of nearly spends the whole of the real kind of spring summer as a yellow field. And they used to put the house cow into that field in. Uh, Kind of start of summer around May time, and all the milk they used to collect they used to turn it all into butter because it was this kind of really, really yellow butter that they got from her. So that yeah, that field is called the Glambui. So we're really lucky that through MJ we have all those kind of old stories and histories that have kind of carried on through the field. So it was never, it wasn't always livestock. It was very mixed, and then livestock I suppose from the 70s on, and there was other ground rented in with it. Um, which is now a sick of heart. So yeah, it would have been stock and rate. I always remember MJ saying that they kind of had a rule that was, uh, they you were pushing it when it was a cow and acre. So <laughs> that was kind of their 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 ideas on it. Interesting, yeah. Um, 
one, one last question before I hand back to Bridget. And um, well, uh, by the way, as well, Michael Darwin, well done, Sinead. You're inspirational. I agree. Um, Sinead, like a lot of what you generate in the farm in terms of nature, those beautiful hedgerows, the species of grassland, the fact that you're organic. I mean, all of those really um, should, and in some cases do have a monetary value, but, but maybe you haven't pursued that angle yet. Um, and I guess uh, the question from Bruce, uh, Sinead, different farmers value success off of different met metrics or metrics. You have completely different values to most. What are yours? <laughs> I'm still figuring that out, Bruce. Uh, <laughs> depends. I, I see, yeah, I think uh, values is definitely something that has probably changed for myself as I've gotten older. Um, yeah we like as i said we we don't get paid to farm the way that we farm but actually all of them things do pay their way in the sense that the people who who buy off us buy off us for all those reasons they buy off us because we're organic they buy off us because we have a species rich grass they buy off us because all our cows have a name and they love that do you know so why we don't get paid in regards to subsidies if there is a value in it in another way and i suppose yeah um like, I hate it when someone asks me what's the dry matter content. I'm like, crap, I really should start measuring that so that I can <laughs> give some really, which I'm going to start from next year. So ask me next year what the dry matter content is for Hector. But yeah, I think the values, uh, we're, everything we do is really based around a particular lifestyle that we want to live. And we want to live off the land and to be able to make a sustainable living, but not necessarily profit at all costs. It's about being able to maintain a particular lifestyle, and part of that lifestyle is farming itself. So, yeah, values. I think it's the work-life yeah. balance. <laughs> that's, that's a great answer. I'm going to hand back to Bridget, but there's a few references for um, sourcing seeds. Um, if you look in the chat box, uh, the person answered, and we'd like to thank Hubert Flanagan's dog who <laughs> attempted <laughs> to give you a reference. <laughs> Didn't quite manage it, but Hubert, thank you, dog. First, Bridget, back to you. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Brendan. Uh, Sinead, I got a, a, a question earlier today, which you, you've kind of covered, but I'm just going to make sure that you've covered all of it. It was from a John Swanick. What grazing techniques and management tools do you use on your farm to ensure you have enough grass throughout the year, but particularly in spring and late autumn? Uh, yeah. Again, next year, I think, will be the real big tester for us because... Um, we actually have a couple of cows calfing in the end of February. We've never had a cow calf in February. So uh, with the sucklers, we always pushed out their calfing a little bit later, uh, March, April, because by the time um, they all been out wintering, they calfed out um, unless we needed to bring them in. Generally, they calfed out because we actually put them into a bit of a wooded area. Um, and they were maybe spending about a week or two on uh, the silage but again our silage is just as species rich as the pasture so everyone was getting the needs they needed and then they were hitting grass normally in the end of April. Uh, this year we actually did start our grazing earlier at the start of April um, and probably because we finished grazing a little bit earlier as well last year in early November actually because we had started on the build and we sold some of our suckers and we were bringing in dairies then in the December. So yeah, generally um, as suckers, how we were managing it was they were hitting grass around mid-April and we were pretty much running them on until it was kind of reaching its end where what we found actually sometimes is we had grass, but it wasn't of the best quality for them when it was kind of coming into that late November and December. So we kind of give them access to the silage as well. So they would pick, they would kind of forage off a little bit and then they'd come back to the silage. But generally, I think managing the grazing with the dairies, we'll probably have a slightly uh, shorter rotation than we did with the, with the suckers. But we just try to stick to our principles of, of, of as much rest as possible as we can. Um, and then obviously, we've also this year built, um, we're building a livestock shed. So from next year, the only thing that we haven't had on the farm is uh, we haven't been able to put out anything onto the ground in the forms of compost and manure or slurry or anything like that. So with the grazing, the land was, the, the, the grazing block was getting enough, but our outside ground actually this year, it, it was, was impacted a little bit because we always graze 
but it still wasn't getting enough life back into it, we'll say, through that. So next year now, we'll actually have stuff to put out into it. So that's going to help. Like if we were getting kind of April to November without anything, then I'm hopeful that with those kind of extra things like the compostable manure and stuff that we'll be able to start a little bit earlier in March. But again, it's, I think that's why holistic adaptive grazing is a better term because adaptive means you have to kind of work with what you're given. Mm -hmm. That's fair enough. Um, so uh, just so you, you feed your cattle silage, uh, is it your own? Do you cut it? When do you cut it? Do you move into haylage at all? Or is it, it is for the nutrient balance, I suppose, versus biodiversity? Do you kind of have a time when you cut? Uh, generally after everything has gone to seed. So once things have gone to seed, um, we normally cut. So some years that will be late July, sometimes it'll be the first week of August. And then normally from start to mid-September, we put uh, stock into it to graze it. So again, yeah, the, the, the two outside pieces of ground, even though they're away from the 17 acres, uh, they're still quite diverse. I think I might have a, a picture there of this year's harvest. Um, so we did different things this year. Uh, last year, we actually allowed them to graze a little bit more. Um, and a little bit tighter in some patches of the silage ground. And the plan for that was, um, the, uh, what we did then was just kind of broadcast some stuff like uh, clovers and uh, stuff like that. Let's see if I have a photo of... Is that your dumb beetles or...? Yes, <laughs> that's thanks to Bruce. Uh, Bruce, you asked that question about values, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, young beetles are my new. Every year I'm discovering new things if it's not the name of the plant. Like this year I discovered self heal, saw it loads of times in the pasture, never really knew what it was about, and uh, I dried a load of it this year to make yeah. it a tea. Um, but yeah, the dung beetles. So Bruce is running uh, the project where he's got us all looking out for them. So mm -hmm. I spend most of my time poking through. Helka. Thanks. Uh, yeah, <laughs> thanks, Ruth. <laughs> I spent a lot of time around ships, but <laughs> great fun. Uh, yeah, so I've just been kind of watching, then I was just, uh, I actually saw this guy as I was walking the cows back out to the field, and I was like, Christ, he's massive. Mm -hmm. um, and then I turned him over. That actually, there, this little silver bit is the end of a, a steak, and yeah. I turned him over, and he loves mice on him as well. So then, Someone else was saying these mice um, eat the larvae of a particular worm burden for cows and livestock as well. So again, it's that diversity and everything kind of has a role to play and kind of more that you can do for that, the benefits you're getting on the other side. Brilliant. Just to go back to some of the questions I have here uh, from, the, from the audience. So Caroline O'Sullivan asks, what advice would you give to a farmer looking to start a micro dairy? And how do you market your products to the public? Uh, my advice would be to go to Raw Milk Ireland first. Um, let me see if I can find their website. Raw Milk Ireland first would definitely be my first advice. Uh, then definitely reach out and speak to the others. Uh, the ones who are trailblazing on the micro dairy front would be Crawford's and uh, Ballymaloo, actually. They are actually technically a little micro dairy as well. And then in regards to selling it, um, yeah, get to know your customer base and kind of figure out where you're going to sell. And for us, we do a lot of stuff on social media. Um, and I find that that's been really, really good to um, reach to people at a, in a cost-effective way. In the sense of financially cost-effective, it can be very time-consuming. Mm -hmm. um, these long winter nights I've had lots of time, so it's been okay to keep social media kind of busy but uh, at the height of summer when you're when you're busy it's kind of hard to remember to post and that's the thing with social media you do have to kind of stay on it the whole time and make sure you're reaching people in that mm -hmm. but yeah in regards to marketing social media is definitely a big element okay uh beth Cobbins asks do you leave calves with the mothers so that the they take the excess milk from the once a day milking uh we last year we trialed um calf at foot which is um, this whole idea of kind of leaving the calf with the cow and sharing the milk. And we tried it on, actually I think I have a photo of herself and myself, my 
little mild short turn there. Um, because I liked the idea of it. And while there's lots of positives, there was also lots of negatives. And it was trying to, like everything that we do, is trying to find the balance between being able to make a living and ensuring that we're doing as much as we can for uh, nature and the, the livestock themselves. So we trialed Catholic Foot with two of them last year and they both reacted to it very differently. Uh, that lady was fine um, for about two weeks and then on her third week, uh, same thing happened with the other one, but it took five weeks. <laughs> uh, they wouldn't give us milk until the calf started to suckle. We used to have to push the calf out of the way <laughs> and try and get the milk ourselves. And that was just for ourselves, the home consumption. And there was other issues then as well. So, you know, you'd bite on the teeth and stuff like that as well. So we decided against it. But what we did do this year was um, uh, when the cows calf down, the calf stayed with them until the colostrum was gone. And so that the calf gets all the colostrum. And pretty much what we did was um, we'd, uh, because we'd built one part of the shed, we brought them into calf and they stayed in for those three to four days. And uh, we just let them out in the morning with the other cows who were grazing and that was it a little bit we then fed the calves there because in organic there's no milk replacement so you feed the cows milk anyhow and we just ensured that the we fed the calf a few hours after they were separated and uh, we fed them again in the evenings so we didn't leave them really long so that they weren't kind of really hungry and looing out and stuff like that and it was actually very low stress for us and that was our experience of it so I think we'll definitely be doing that again next year because um, it's been a really great start for the calf. They're getting all the costume that they need um, and it's pretty low stress. And there hasn't been too strong of a bond. What we found last year when we tried the calf at foot with these two was um, when we went to separate them at uh, three months, it was just as stressful as it was when we were uh, doing sucklers and trying to wean. So we've also been trying out different things over weaning with the suckers over the last few years. We put them either side of the fence and uh, once they've kind of had four or five days separation, we push the fence out so the cows are going this way and the calves are going that way. Mm -hmm. um, and that kind of helps on the weaning front. But, yeah. Learning journey. Uh, Dory Nelda asks, um, do you aim to grow your dairy into wholesale enterprise or keep selling direct to customers? Um, do you have other enterprises you aim to try in the future? Uh, Yes, uh, being a micro dairy, the aim is to process obviously the milk into other uh, items, but each one of those items, obviously every time you do process, it brings more testing as well, uh, which is a thing that you have to factor in. And also, uh, you know, making stuff like butter. So for us, for us to make butter, we need to have an outlet for skim milk. Um, so there's different things like that that you need to, to think about it. But yeah, we definitely intend on doing more. That's why we built the processing room, per se. But uh, in regards to selling into a co-op, no, because it makes no financial sense at our scale. Um, and I, we don't have much interest in going into supermarkets because I find, um, having spoken to a lot of our slim producers, it can be uh, a race to the bottom. So. Our aim is to really be as direct as we can. And if we could supply the local community, then that would pretty much be enough for us. Mm -hmm. um, and then after that, it would be kind of into independent stores, um, I think, which is, there, there's a growing movement of as well. So as long as they stick around, hopefully we won't have to go to the city. <laughs> right. uh, Esther and Ollie O'Brien, I think, uh, is there a lot of red tape that with setting up the micro dairy? Um, yeah, like your first point of call really will be to speak to the department and uh, find out rules and regulations, uh, build, you know, having a processing room is the same as any food processing room. You know, you have to have the wash of the walls and all those kind of things. It can seem a bit daunting um, doing anything that involves selling direct um, and do it yourself, but you know, it, it's, uh, There's other people doing it, so there is ways around it. It can seem daunting, but look at, I think everything these days comes with red tape. So. Yeah, and it sounds like, you know, you've mentioned a few times, like the Raw Milk Association, like there's the support. Raw Milk Ireland, yeah. yeah. And there's, there's people who are doing it that you, you can ask that tried and tested methods and, you know, they ask how to get through things. 
Um, you've got some really lovely compliments coming in uh, on what an inspiration you are, so well done. Uh, but one a, a question here from Kyle Sweeney. Uh, thanks, Sinead, to inspire and to, and to guide you. What resources do you advise in terms of organizations, books, people's songs, or poems? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, poems. I'm, I'm never great at poems, but I'm, I can always remember the odd quote, and I'm a massive Wendell Berry fan. Um, so that probably definitely aligns with my values uh, uh, on that side. There's also a great book called Letters to a Young Farmer. And um, it's from, I think it's the Stone Barns in the States that commissioned it. But it's a load of short letters from activists, scientists, other farmers to everything written to kind of young farmers. And I, I really hate the young, well, I'd like to think I'm a young farmer, but we're not. Uh, but yeah, it's a nice kind of way to think about farming and what you're doing. That's probably something else that aligns with values. And then on the practical front, uh, there's a great book. And now I can't think of it off the top of my head. <laughs> I must pull it up. Um, I must send you on a list. Oh, I think Sarah is her name. It's a grading book, but it's a great uh, kind of introduction into adaptive grading, holistic grading. Obviously, then there's the 3LM, uh, the Savory Institute, if you want to kind of really go into the science of holistic. Uh, a great point to call on the Irish front is not. Mm -hmm. And there's also Regenerative Farming Ireland Facebook page. There's a lot of people on there sharing stuff. Um, follow Bruce on Twitter for stuff on dung beetles. And I think if you start on the dung beetles, that's automatically going to get you talking uh, on different fronts of using maybe less on the dosing front and then that's definitely going to bring you into how you're grazing and what you're grazing um, but yeah it's point to call farmer for nature other farmers i think one of the the advantage of having future was i got to meet loads of farmers and then we just got um cheeky after that and just contacted people and said you know i, I contacted uh, brian costello and said i've never actually been on dairy farm can you please invite me to your farm so I can see what it's like uh, so yeah just talk to other farmers don't be afraid to talk to them and then after that farm for nature nuts um, and things like that and uh, yeah regenerative farming Ireland all those kind of groups are great. I tell you actually Colin Dealey and Mimi Crawford have helped you out here it's good to have friends. Good. Uh, the Art and Science of Grazing by Sarah yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a good one for uh, people to try uh, check out. Um, so lots of people are saying here. Thanks so much for sharing and all your hard work. Those meadows are incredibly beautiful from Linda Galitsisnan. Uh, love to hear about the plantain. Did not know that. Um, a real credit to you both from William Fitzsimmons. Uh, so I'm, yeah, uh, Sinead, It's a true example of what farm one farm can achieve, both for nature and the quality of life. Uh, Rowan McNair and um, this is my last question, and then I'll finish off, and I'll, I'll ask Brendan to give you one final uh, question and, and finish off as well. Uh, Brendan McNairn has asked, have you thought about adding trees to the mix going towards agroforestry? Yes and no. Um, I have dreams of, I love trees, <laughs> so I have dreams of like every few, few meters being a tree, uh, but it's trying to find a balance between what we have and, and what we don't have. So, like, our biggest field at the minute is three acres. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can find it here. Our biggest field is three acres. So, putting it into agroforestry, I think, might have an impact um, on our meadows, we'll say. Um, so, what we do instead is we allow the hedgerows to grow up like this. And we every year we take part in the trees in the land and any gaps that we have in our hedgerows we plant in there as well so in the last three years we've planted 250 uh, native trees and then everything after that it's just a matter of uh, protecting them and letting them go and um, just encouraging uh, the hedgerows to grow really so some like this one here we actually allow the cows to go right up underneath it because i think i have a photo of it there and um, the year that we had the drought in 2018 we actually graze the meadow field because uh, in our meadow field we have a lot of, uh, as you see here in this photo, meadow fiscals and different grasses which do quite well in drought. So we were still having growth um, even during the drought and the other benefit was that uh, the cows had loads of shade from that big hedgerow. 
and then in other ones um, like here there's no trees in this hedge so we've uh, moved our fence out from it a little bit and we're allowing it to thicken and then we've planted in kind of saplings in that to try and let it grow up uh, at the cost of losing our view to grow Patrick there for sure I can see that when I go over to Westport. <laughs> Um, For people who don't know, trees, uh, trees on the land, it's called, isn't it? Uh, every yeah, trees on the land, great on initiative. The land. Okay, yeah. So every year they um, put out to to anyone that they have bunches of uh, saplings and trees that you can pick up uh, all across Ireland at different pickup spots. Um, and I think this year though, it's twenty five quid for a, a batch of them. It used to be free, but I think they had to kind of. Can it, uh, give some commitment to it so um but it's worth checking out if people would like to have uh, to get trees on their land um Sinead, i'm just going to finish up thank you so much for all your inspiring work what you've achieved it's lovely to chat to you it's lovely that you're on such an adaptive journey and it's it seems to be changing the whole time and that you're picking up new tricks of the trade all the time and um, so thanks for your contribution if anyone in the crowd has further questions for Sinead or other farmers, we now have a Farming for Nature forum on our website, farmingfornature.ie, where you can stick up questions um, under different sections, whether it's dairy or multi-species woods, whatever, and a variety of farmers can engage and answer. So it's a, it's a nice way to, if you do have questions, don't be shy, do ask um, how you can make these changes on your land. Um, if you know someone who hasn't been able to join us tonight, a uh, recording of this will be up on our YouTube channel by hopefully tomorrow afternoon. And um, and then finally, uh, next week we have organic dairy farmer from County Leash, John McHugh, join us. So do register through our uh, homepage, farmingfornature.ie. Sinead, thank you so much again. Brendan, over to you for the final final question. Yeah, thanks, Sinead. Uh, if I had one question, it was going to be about John's beard, but I'll leave that aside and I'll ask you, um, what, have you any regret? What's your main regret on your journey so far? And what's your vision for the farm in the future? A double-sided a double -sided question. Uh, main regret, but hindsight is a great thing. I wish... And I think vision wise, I think for me, um, I feel agriculture is very much at a crossroads and it, it you know, there's, there's two clear paths and one of them is, <clears throat> is, is uh, you know, resource intensive, uh, an intensive model, a lot of kind of smart agriculture, technological, and I think farmers will lose a lot of autonomy in that kind of model long term. And then the other model is really Farmers who are just kind of, uh, I suppose, reevaluating why they're farming, reconnecting with farming and nature, the livestock, what they do, the livestock balance. Like I saw today an article that was talking about um, an 18 year old kid in the 80 hour work week he had, you know, and had, and this was a great work ethic. And I thought, 80 hours a week at 18, that's not, <laughs> you know, that's not a way to live. Um, so yeah, I think maybe we need to sit back and decide, uh, reassess really where we want to go. And I think that's really for every part of our lives right now, particularly under, you know, the context of climate change and stuff. But uh, I definitely feel that's probably already happening without um, those big conversations, maybe at policy level. You know, there's so many farmers and you see it yourselves through Farmer for Nature that are doing things from small things to big things. Um, that are just having massive impact. And I think that is spreading and there's definitely a grass, a, literally a grassroots movement um, for, for kind of farming. I suppose rather maybe with, with than alongside nature and seeing ourselves as part of it, not something, it's not something that we manage, you know. Great, well, listen, thank you, Sinead. And it's lovely to hear of somebody um, who's kind of new to farming on a voyage of discovery, but who's, who's getting so much pleasure from, from the land, from nature, and from the livestock and the whole lifestyle. I think that in itself is inspiration. So thanks, and thanks to everybody who joined the call tonight.
I will hope to see you again next week. Thank you and good night. Thanks, everyone.